Uh, well, good morning. And uh, I'm actually going to start not talking about the Jurassic. <laughs> I just got back from uh, uh, a trip to Ireland where I was bird watching, essentially. And um, I had to go to Valencia Island, and I knew that they had these Devonian tracks that were um, just described in detail. They've been known since about 1992. They were just described in detail um, last year. And I just thought you'd like to see a picture of them. And for those of you who have any Celtic uh, blood, you might be interested to know that the Celtic word for, te uh, for trackway. Um, I was born on St. Patrick's Day, so I had to show you that. So <laughs> now, to, now to the Jurassic, and I warn the BLM people here that I don't have an acknowledgement slide at the end, but I figure I can get away with it because I have uh, three BLM co-authors, so I'm thanking them for their participation um, right away. Um, this is a, a talk just essentially about a couple of new track sites that we found in uh, near Moab. It's, uh, it's a beautiful area. I was thinking of patenting uh, this golden moment or this slide before the current government gets a hold of it. And uh, so where, where are we talking about? We're talking about uh, the area uh, uh, near Moab. And um, I'm going to just basically tell you about a couple of track sites uh, that we've found just recently. But just very briefly as background, I've been going to Moab, believe it or not, for about 35 years. And as everybody probably knows, there are many, many dinosaur tracks in this area. Probably we're talking, if you, if you really could uh, document every one, we're probably talking about not just hundreds, but uh, possibly thousands. So it's a very, very rich, uh, rich area for, um, for tracks. And some of them are just uh, beautifully preserved. Um, uh, I would like to tease the people who work on bones that say, when we have footprints, we always have the whole foot and the flesh. So um, we, have, we have just beautiful, uh, beautiful material. Um, we already know that the Glen Canyon group, and I'm uh, talking, of course, about the Wingate Cayenta Navajo, basically, is a sort of tracker's paradise. Uh, when, we work, when we were working in the uh, Lake Powell or Dan Canyon uh, National Recreation Area, we literally, in the sh course of a fairly short survey that was funded at a very modest level um, by the uh, national parks, we documented about 115 sites in a, in a few years, and most of them, or all of them, were in, uh, in the Glen Canyon group. So, uh, and Andrew's been doing similar work down here. So, uh, all of southern Utah is just full of, uh, of tracks. And uh, this, is, uh, this is very much out of date, but you can see uh, when we published, we published the black uh, part of the histogram um, in about 1995, and uh, then we sort of updated it here, and you can see that already we're running out of space for some of our Glen Canyon uh, track sites. <laughs> I suppose most of the people here, I don't need to uh, talk much about the stratigraphy. I keep stressing here that we have hundreds and hundreds of sites. And part of the reason I want to do that is because at the end, I just want to say a few words about how important uh, the tracks are for characterizing the vertebrate faunas in this area. So let's actually go to these sites uh, that we've been looked at, uh, looking at recently. And as I said, we know of hundreds of sites in the um, Moab area. Some of them are small sites, some of them are larger. Uh, and this is where we're working at the moment. And we have a, 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 an exposure here, track exposure here, but when we measure the section, we find tracks practically uh, every few meters going up the section. So this is a very preliminary, uh, just a field uh, notebook uh, sketch showing uh, this particular level here, which is the lowest level uh, where we've uh, encountered tracks at this particular locality. 
It turns out, we thought we had, were seeing it and documenting it for the first time, but it turns out that the BLM knew about it in 2008 and didn't tell us, but um, we found out anyway. And um, this is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you now, this is a very large site and so is this one, and I'm not gonna talk about the, uh, the stuff in between. Let's see. So, um, firstly, we ha can actually just find around this area some uh, loose tracks that are beautifully preserved. Here's a little grouter track on these uh, ripple marks. Uh, this is my uh, favorite one, just a perfect track, just sitting there. That's actually in situ where the surface is eroding. Just picked it up, made a replica of it, gave it to Re uh, Rebecca at the BLM. Um, you can see these in the University of Colorado collections. Uh, collected this one, just picked them right up last, last year. Uh, now it turns out that the, the BLM did some uh, early, what perhaps you might call historic photogrammetry back in 2008, just on this little, little area up here. So that's why the tracks are in red. And the, it's a very unusual preservation up here because the tracks are sort of compressional features and they're preserved as as uh, unusual pedestals. I have this, um, uh, I, I like to map the whole site because then you can see, you can draw rose diagrams and see which way the different tracks are going and so forth. I point out here some of the tracks we collected or, or molded. Um, so this is what the BLM did a preliminary survey on and uh, uh, preliminary photogrammetry on this little area. So that's about five meters by five meters and then um, we did the, with the map here at the end of last year. This is um, the photogrammetry that my co-author Nefra passed on to me from 2008. So I guess this is nine-year-old photogrammetry. I don't really know what that means. I just take the pictures, give them to uh, Nefra, and uh, she, she, she processes them. But you can see here I've drawn in some of the trackway. Uh, there seems to be some sort of preferred orientation and I could perhaps go back here and point out that these gray arrows are um, uh, the trackways that we've picked out that are uh, distinct from the sort of background of, of various isolated tracks. Um, I will say that there, um, photogrammetry cannot answer all of our questions and some of the, you cannot see all of the tracks uh, in, in, in this image, uh, and the human eye is still quite useful for adding in some of these tracks. I also uh, want to point out, and this is not a slur, um, uh, but um, there's a lot of debris here that shows up beautiful, beautifully in the photogrammetry, but we did, have, we did clean this site in order to um, map as many tracks as uh, possible. So I'm gonna jump right ahead now to the um, upper level, because I, I promised to skip, skip over this, because the, these are just fairly, uh, a few tracks at these different levels. And um, we were just, uh, I was just measuring the section up from the lower level, and lo and behold, what did I find here? A much larger site in terms of the number of um, footprints and a very, very high density of, of Gralata tracks. And this is a, a view of the main site on just the second visit where we, um, we didn't have to do much excavating, just clear off uh, some sand here. And uh, I can't see from here, but uh, yeah, you may see uh, some, some chalk here uh, highlighting some of these uh, or outlining some of these some of these tracks. Uh, so this is a this is a preliminary map of of that main site. And let me say right away that this is just part of it. There's there's another area here and uh, other areas here, and um, there's a very thin layer of of sand. You can see it here of of, of overburden. Uh, it'll be easier to easier to clear this and make it into a site possibly with five or six hundred or a thousand tracks. My colleague Gerard, who's here, and you can ask him about this because it's a little bit above my pay grade, 
Um, he's, been, uh, he's been using this um, sort of photo, uh, a program that you can merge these photos together in order to um, give you an undistorted uh, image of the whole site. Um, that's another way of saying when you've got this kind of density of tracks here, it's very laborious to even try and uh, map this to make a sort of black and white outline map uh, by using compass and grid methods. Another way of uh, saying uh, of, of saying that it's laborious is for me to say perhaps I'm just lazy, and I would rather um, have you know draw my map from from a photograph, and um, then it's then it's kind of more accurate. Perhaps what I'm saying can be demonstrated here and showing, you know, here's the, here's the photograph of this. This is another little site off to the side. And um, here's a more accurate outline than I could draw just by hand on a grid <coughs> or I or anybody who's mapping in what um, Brent and Nefra have called my mapping or this sort of old style of mapping with compass and grid, ichnocartography which I think is just uh, another way of saying uh, making maps of tracks. But here's a, here's a photogra photogrammetric image of this surface, and here's the sort of psychedelic, you know, colored version, uh, which allows us to measure depth and, and so forth. Um, this is a little closer view of that same surface, just to show the kind of um, detail that you can get, and uh, you can, um, between having images of this and, uh, and me you're measuring directly, you can get measurements off this or you can have this in your hand when you go back in the field and, and, and measure the individual tracks. <coughs> it's hard to pick out trackways here. We haven't really got to that stage, but I just wanted to show you um, that this is a site uh, with huge potential to get uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data. Uh, the large tracks uh, probably do just call them Chiantipus. Uh, for, for the time being, the smaller ones uh, are Growlitur. Um, the one that I really got excited about, because this is the largest and best uh, preserved Otazoom that I've seen, I think, anywhere in the Glen, Glen Canyon. Uh, this is part of a trackway. Here's my co-author, uh, uh, Gerard, working hard. Um, uh, we have about five tracks in this uh, in this sequence. It's one of about five or six Otazoom trackways at the site. And you can see very nicely the individual pad impressions. This thing's about 40 centimeters long. It's one of the largest ones. And it's uh, presumably um, associated with a, um, or uh, attributed to a, a prosauropod. Um, I've been quite interested in looking at the sort of what I, what I call the morphodynamic variation uh, in, uh, across the Sauristian clade, where we have uh, narrow gauge theropod trackways. And sometimes we have narrow gauge otozoom, but sometimes we have wide gauge otozoom. Now, when I try and talk to people about morphodynamics, their eyes glaze over, and uh, they think I'm just using big words for the hell of it. But, um, so I don't push it. I'd rather go below the radar a little bit with morphodynamics. But um, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, it's very interesting that uh, these narrow-bodied theropods generally have narrow trackways. Uh, the sauropods, uh, we have narrow and wide gauge forms in different clades. So generally, the diplodocids um, Smaller, narrower-bodied diplodocids uh, probably uh, result, uh, produce the narrow-gauge trackways, and the large brachiosaurid or titanosaurids produce the wide-gauge trackways. In Otozoum, which is a prosauropod, we have narrow and wide-gauge trackways within um, what we would call the same uh, ichnogenus. So this seems to be interesting because there's a lot of debate about whether prosauropods were uh, bipedal or quadrupedal. Um, this, uh, and I'm adding to the debate by saying were, uh, we can say were they uh, narrow gauge or wide gauge in their um, uh, 
uh, posture or their locomotion. And what I'm saying is that they're both. Now, whether the small ones were more inclined to be narrow gauge and the large ones were more inclined to be wide gauge remains to be seen. But it's only really in the Moab area so far that we have good Otazoom uh, trackways um, rather than isolated tracks in the Glen Canyon group. Now, Andrew may prove me wrong because he's always finding uh, lots of new, new track sites. And we've certainly found uh, Otazoom down at um, Lake Powell. Anyway, um, I'd like to just uh, wrap this up then by saying, uh, uh, making a few synthesis comments. It's, it's undeniable that tracks are uh, extremely abundant in the Glen Canyon group. This is what I've called a type two deposit. A type one deposit has only tracks, and a type five deposit has only bones. A type two is dominantly tracks with a few bone sites or skeletal body fossil sites. A type three is sort of more or less equal part, type equal uh, body fossils and trace fossils. A type four would be mostly bones and a few tracks. So as a tracker, I'm interested in uh, type one and type two deposits. They vastly, uh, the track record vastly, vastly superior in terms of pure abundance to the bone record in some deposits. In the Cretaceous, the Dakota is the best example, but the Glen Canyon group is a pretty good example of a type two deposit in the Jurassic. The other thing which I think is important as, as we build databases, everybody's you know, mad about more and more information, more and more data, is that taken as a regional whole, the ichnofaunas are remarkably consistent from one site to, uh, you know, across the whole Glen Canyon group. And it's true in, in other major deposits like the um, Dakota or whatever. Uh, so we have remarkable consistency when we look at the, the whole uh, ichnofauna, uh, the big picture of the Glen Canyon. But um, and in, in order of consistency, we have uh, dominated by theropods and uh, otosum, which is a prosauropod. So it's, it's sauristian dominated. Uh, things like Batrachopus, which are a crocodilomorph, uh, and Anamipus, uh, which represent a ornithistian, are less common. And uh, Brasilichnium is really found anywhere except within the actual sand dune facies. So all of these are sort of interdune uh, track makers. Uh, they're found actually at this time in the lower Jurassic uh, worldwide uh, to some extent. I mean, not everywhere, but in many places. And Brasilicnium is a dune uh, uh, ichnite, if you like, representing a, a, a synapsid. So um, having said that uh, uh, there's remarkable consistency in uh, these tracks across the Glen Canyon group, and the, which is the lower Jurassic here in uh, Utah, if we look site by, and that's important that we have this consistency because this is what scientists like to say is that predictability, repeatability is important. But if we look at the individual sites, uh, the two I've just shown you, um, we have locally quite different uh, faunas. So not all of these things run to be together and party together uh, at the same waterhole or the same spot. So we, uh, individually, we get niche partitioning. Uh, and so that's why I've shown you one site that has Gralata and Otazuum dominantly, and another site that has just uh, only uh, possibly only Chiantopus. So uh, my last slide is basically sort of trying to stress this, that um, uh, we have tremendous potential for um, finding more and more stuff in the Glen Canyon group and in, in all, all across Utah, uh, especially in the uh, Moab area where we're working now. Um, I want to stress that these large databases are proving very, very valuable. When you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of sites in the Glen Canyon group for tracks, and you've only got three or four or five, I think that's in, uh, in the abstracts volume, we only have one body fossil from this group in Utah and another one in, um, 
in Arizona. So it was a pretty small sample. Um, and again, I would uh, just stress something that perhaps we know already, that um, we have a Sauristian dominated ichnofauna um, at this time right across uh, Utah. Um, the regional distribution is very consistent, but the local distribution is, is, is variable. And um, that, I think, tells us something about the ecology. That regionally, we have uh, a, a very easily defined ichnofauna, but uh, local, or regionally defined fauna, but locally, we get this niche partitioning. So thank you very much. <laughs>